to those that are here, hello everyone, thank you for coming um, and happy Valentine's Day. It's a perfect um, day to express our love for biological anthropology with this seminar. Um, as you may have noticed from our promotional material, today's talk was organised as a collaboration between the Archaeological Field Club, um, Cambridge University Biological Anthropology Society and the Cambridge Journal of Human Behaviour. Um, the opportunity presented itself for us to collaborate, so we thought this would be a good way to reach a broader audience and support fellow Cambridge societies um, with overlapping interests. Today we'll be hearing from Professor Dan Daniel Lieberman, um, who will be asking the question, why is exercise weird but healthy? The active grandparent hypothesis. And although I am sure you are familiar with Dan and his research, we just wanted to briefly introduce our speaker as usual. Thanks, Regina. So Professor Lieberman is the chair uh, of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. Uh, he's the Edwin M. Lerner Professor of Biological Sciences and a professor of human evolutionary biology. He has gone from a Cambridge student himself, having received his MPhil in biological anthropology here uh, in 1987, to require reading for all archaeology undergraduates specializing in biological anthropology. He is renowned in his research regarding the evolution of hominid locomotion, and most especially his research on endurance running. He's also greatly interested in evolutionary medicine, uh, the evolution of the human head, the study of physical activity, its energetics, biomechanics, and how all of these were brought about by evolution. Yeah, and as Sophia mentioned, while all of us studying biological anthropology here have to read a bit of his academic work, um, I first became familiar with uh, Professor Lieberman and his work uh, many, what for me was many years ago, um, with his multiple appearances on the American public television show Nova, in which he can be seen talking about evolution in one scene, conducting scientific studies on running in another, and then physically running around Cambridge, Massachusetts himself in yet another scene. And Beyond his appearances on public television, he has communicated science to the public via some of his books, such as The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health, and Disease, as well as Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. He is also on the Scientific Executive Committee of the Leakey Foundation and has been elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, and finally, he's also awarded the 2009 Ig Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on why pregnant women don't tip over. Uh, so with that, let's please welcome Professor Dan Lieberman. <laughs> Thank you. I think my Ig Nobel is the, by far the my thing I'm most proud of. So let me share my screen here. And uh, it's very kind of you to invite me uh, virtually uh, to this uh, meeting. And um, I... Uh, I, I had a great time back in the day at, at uh, Cambridge and um, very fond of uh, my memories there. So, and a happy Valentine's Day to everybody. So today I'm gonna talk about why exercise is weird but healthy and uh, the active grandparent hypothesis. And I hope that we can uh, engender a little bit of a discussion. <clears throat> so um, without further ado, um, um, as uh, the very kind introduction just mentioned, I, I study how and why the human body is the way it is. I started off as a, really, as a you know, paleontologist interested in fossils, but uh, my work is, I still do some of that, but my work has really uh, uh, evolved into really studying the human body and, pe and living people. And so I combine field work with um, experimental biomechanics and physiology, which we do in the lab in the field, but I still also look at fossils and the fossil record and, 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 and comparative anatomy. So it's kind of a mixture of things. And, and over the years, my research has kind of shifted to studying the evolution of human physical activity. And um, I'm, probably best known for my work on running, but I've studied all kinds of other physical activities like walking and throwing and things like that. And, um, and if you work on this kind of stuff, you quickly, um, uh, or excuse me, I should say that a lot of the talks I, I typically give are sort of you know biomechanics. And a lot of the work we do in my lab is for example, on biomechanics of locomotion. And so I'd be happy giving a lectures on you know, foot biomechanics and that kind of stuff and, and, and whatever. But today I'm gonna give a kind of a 30,000 foot uh, uh, talk um, kind of a grand picture, kind of a big picture, to give an evolutionary discussion about, about physical activity and exercise and why it's so healthy. And so I wanna ask two kind of 30,000 foot questions. The first is why if exercise do most people avoid it? Uh, so in the United States, for example, and I don't think England is any different, um, if you take the World Health Organization recommendation that everybody get 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a week, 
Um, only about 20% of Americans do that, the other 80% don't. In fact, only 50% of Americans ever exercise at all. Um, and then the second question I wanna ask is why is exercise increasingly healthy as we age? And I think an evolutionary perspective can help us with both of these questions. So to do that, I'm gonna propose two hypotheses. So one is the active couch potato hypothesis, which is that we evolved to be physically active, but to avoid unnecessary physical activity, AKA exercise. And then perhaps more importantly, the active grandparent hypothesis, which we just published in PNAS, which is that we evolved extended health spans. So the years that you live without major disease. Um, and of course, in the old days before modern medicine, health span equaled lifespan, um, not just to be physically active, but also because of physical activity. Okay. And of course, our basic framework is natural selection, which of course is the combination of variation heritability and differ differential reproductive success, which favors adaptations, right? Novel features that were shaped by natural selection that improve reproductive success. And of course, a very basic idea behind natural selection is that energy is really very often selected, right? The basic equation of life is using energy to make more life, right? And for most creatures, <clears throat> modern humans, especially from the royal family accepted, uh, energy availability is a limited resource, right? When you have limited resource, like, you know, like the, the time you're spending listening to me right now is time that you can never spend doing some, something else, right? So when you have a limited resource, you have to engage in trade-offs. You have to make decisions about how you're gonna allocate that limited resource. And a standard uh, uh, way of thinking about this is, is, is it's often called energy allocation theory. So you can spend the energy that you get from eating food on five things, right? You can spend it on growing, you can spend it on maintaining your body. You can, you can use it to store fat, so that's a two-way arrow. You can spend it on reproduction and you can spend it on physical activity. And ultimately, the only thing that natural selection really cares about in the end is how many offspring you have who survive and reproduce. So if you can save, save on growth and maintenance and storage and physical activity, you can then devote more of it to reproduction and natural selection is pretty much always going to favor that. Okay, so that leads to uh, this first hypothesis, the active couch potato hypothesis, that we evolved to be physically active uh, to avoid unnecessary physical activity. In other words, we avoid a strong selection uh, to, uh, to allocate energy from physical activity towards reproduction. And in my opinion, we, you know, we could go back really far, but I'm gonna just talk about this as a two-stage process. The first involving the origins of the hominins from the great apes, and the second are the origins of the genus Homo. So, um, great apes are um, essentially um, have been selected to be couch potatoes, right? So, so uh, uh, you know, chimpanzees, gorillas, other great apes have very costly life histories compared to most monkeys, right? They have a they spend a lot more time growing, um, so they have a longer period of infancy and, and juvenility. They also have extremely costly locomotion. If you put a, a, a oxygen mask on a chimpanzee and get it on a treadmill. Uh, it spends about twice as much energy per unit mass per unit distance as a typical mammal, including humans. And as a result, um, these animals are incredibly inactive. If any of you have had the, a good fortune to spend time watching chimpanzees or gorillas in the wild, you'll know that, well, you better bring a book because they're, they're, most of the time they're really not doing much of anything. They're just kind of lounging around eating. In fact, they spend 50% of their day uh, just stuffing their, their mouths. So this is a paper that Dave Reichlin and I just published a, um, just a few weeks ago, actually, in Current Biology, uh, where we collected all the data on steps per day and you know, distance traveled for, for various uh, apes. As you can see, um, if you look at the great apes, they have very small numbers of steps per day. Um, even sedentary humans, uh, average humans in industrialized countries um, uh, have higher step counts per day than, than the great apes. And of course, hunter-gatherers, are way, way, way higher, about 18,000 steps a day. And, um, and there are many ways of measuring this, um, and a very simple one, which is actually flawed, um, but, uh, but nonetheless useful, is what's called the physical activity level, which is your, uh, or your PAL, which is your total energy you spend in a day divided by your basal metabolic rate. So theoretically, this corrects for body size, actually. It's, it's a somewhat flawed metric, but it's reasonable. It's good enough for, the, for what we're talking about today. And most mammals have physical activity levels around two to three. Um, whereas the great apes all have physical activity levels of 1.5 or, or less. They're, they're by, by animal standards, they're couch potatoes. And, but humans, if you look at hunter-gatherers, for example, or, or humans from other parts of the world, we tend to have much higher physical activity levels. They average around two. Of course, there's variation. So it's been about a 50% increase in that physical activity level metric. And, and, and so when and where did that happen? And as I said before, 
I believe that it, it really, um, it begins it's a, a two-stage process. So the first stage was the origins of bipedalism. And we have pretty good evidence um, that the earliest hominins were bipeds of some sort. So Sahelanthropus, for example, whatever you think about the, all the controversies about it, there's no way to, to, to the, this, this creature had a frame and magnum that pointed downward. And if a frame and magnum points downward, it's a biped. There's no other way for it to have locomoted. Um, Ardipithecus has plenty of evidence that it was a biped in, of some sort or another. Um, so we know that that you know that's probably the major thing that set humans off on a different evolutionary uh, path from the apes. And, and and one of the potential advantages was that it's more efficient, right? So so hominins spend or humans spend twice as less energy moving a given distance and a given mass uh, than apes. But it also has um, uh, trade-offs, right? Everything has trade-offs that have some setbacks. And one of them is that it makes us awkward. And the other is it makes us slow. If you have only two legs, you're just half as fast as if you had four legs. It's, pretty, it's as simple as that. And so we must have been easy pickings for carnivores uh, for millions and millions of years who could easily outrun even the very fastest human beings. So of course, things get a little bit more, if, more sophisticated in the genus Australopithecus, and we know that they're effective walkers, but they also were still able to climb trees. But then the next big shift occurs um, in the genus Homo, right? And this is a period of, of major climatic change. So this is a graph that many of you hope, hopefully have seen in class. This is the, the famous Zacos curve of the temperatures of the Earth's ocean over the last few million years. And you can see that starting around 2.8 million years ago, there's major cooling, right? And that's the beginning essentially of the ice age. And as that cooling occurs, um, we know from lots of evidence that there's, there's uh, environmental change. Uh, it's, now it's not a completely simple story, but we know that there's essentially an increase in more open habitats. And if you're a hominin out there, used to living in somewhat wooded habitats and you're in a more open habitat, that leads to an interesting uh, challenge. And we, we know from the fossil record as well as the archeological record that that led to the hunting and gathering system, right? So this is a system where you have some combination of meat eating, whether from scavenging or hunting, you have extractive gatherings. So you're not just picking berries off trees, you're also digging and, you know, you know, collecting high quality resources. It involves tool making and food processing. And of course it involves cooperation. So this kind of combination of systems, uh, of, of factors leads to this, this wonderful system. But hunting and gathering is not um, work for couch potatoes, right? So we know, for example, that average human hunter gatherers, if you adjust for body mass and also environmental temperature, are spending about 573 kilocalories per day more than, than say chimpanzees or um, and even more than gorillas um, um, on, on physical activity, on what we call active energy expenditure. Um, a simple way of thinking about that is that your average chimpanzee walks two to four kilometers a day, um, whereas the average female hunter-gatherer walks eight to nine kilometers a day, and the average male hunter-gatherer walks 12 to 15 kilometers a day. And this is from you know, widespread data from quite a few different uh, groups. So, so clearly, uh, physical activity levels are are increased. And one, and it's not just uh, walking; it's also running. And one thing I've been very interested in my life is how did you know these wimpy bipeds manage to become meat eaters? Right, as I mentioned before, humans by by virtue of being bipedal are necessarily slow. So Usain Bolt, for example, uh, can run uh, ten point four meters a second at his fastest, or when he was still competing, but he couldn't only do that for a few seconds, right? Um, for less than 30 seconds. And of course he has no natural weapons or natural defenses. Your average mammal out there in the savanna can run twice as fast as Bolt and for many, many more, uh, you know, many times longer, right? For at least four minutes. And the kinds of weaponry that we typically associate with hunting were not invented until at least 500,000 years ago. So, so putting a stone point on a spear is that was, was the oldest uh, such uh, uh, implement is known to be about 500,000 years ago from Southern Africa. Um, so like, so how do they hunt, right? And, and we think the answer, of course, is endurance running. And so the way it works is that, um, so this is a graph of, 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 of human uh, 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 locomotor speeds compared to a horse, a pony, and a dog. And in orange, we've got running, and in blue, we've got walking. Um, actually, in blue, we have actually a trotting, excuse me, for the, for, which is for, for quadrupeds, they're long distance gait. You can't make quadrupeds uh, gallop long distances. Um, and uh, you can see that the human uh, endurance running range uh, is actually above the trot gallop transition speed of actually all of these animals, including horses. Although I dare say most of us watching this um, uh, cannot run, um, you know, five or six meters per second for very long. Uh, but of course, 
elite, elite athletes can, but even average, you know, professors like me can run above the trot gallop transition speed of ponies and dogs. In fact, I did that this morning on my, on my run around the Charles River, right? And so, um, so humans can run long distances uh, at speeds that exceed the trot gallop transition speed of most quadrupeds. And why is that important? Because when we run, we cool by sweating. We, when you run, you generate a lot of heat. <clears throat> and um, um, in fact, uh, about, about only about one quarter of the energy you use when you're, look, when you're running is actually goes into movement. The other three quarters goes into heat. And you have to dump that heat. And uh, the way that quadrupeds uh, dump that heat is by panting, right? Short little shallow breaths. But when you gallop, which is a seesaw gait, and your body tilts like a seesaw, um, you can't get you can't pant because the viscera the di are are slamming into the diaphragm with each stride. This is well known and well studied. So 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 uh, galloping quadrupeds can't pant, but we cool by sweating. So we've decoupled our thermoregulation uh, from locomotion, and that enables us to do some really cool things. So one is power scavenging, and this is well documented in different cultures. But in the middle of the day, uh, if you know that there's a a, a, a meat resource like a, a you know like a kill, for example. And you see, for example, if you see vultures in the distance, you can run. And if you can get there in the middle of the day before the hyenas do, right, as you can see from this wonderful photoshopped image, which of course does not, you know, um, you can you have a you have yourself, you know, some excellent, you know, food to eat, right? Bones to scavenge, etc. Um, and then the other, uh, and I think really exciting uh, way of hunting is called persistence hunting, and still still practiced very rarely though. Uh, but we have ethnographic evidence from all around the world. But in the middle of the day, when it's really hot, you pick an, an animal and the bigger, the better, because the larger you are, the more heat you generate. So bigger animals like bigger humans overheat faster. And then the hunter or hunters usually, they'll, they'll run, they'll chase the animal. It'll, the animal has to gallop uh, to run away and then it hides under a bush, uh, tries to recover its, its body temperature. And then you, you walk while that you're doing that to, to track it, chase it again. And it's a combination of walking and running, tracking and chasing. And eventually you can run pretty much any animal uh, if you're good at, the, and the hard part is actually not the running, it's the tracking, because they're running at a very gradual pace. Um, and usually it takes about, uh, you know, a half marathon basically to drive prey into hyperthermia as this, this hunter is doing here with this kudu, right? So that's called persistence hunting. And it's well documented. And um, it's been, you know, we, we, we have evidence from it, from every ethnographic evidence from every, every, uh, every, every continent, except for, of course, um, Antarctica. So all in all, you know, walking, running, digging, all kinds of other things. I haven't gone into <clears throat> all the other kinds of physical activities, but there's been a, a more than doubling of physical activity levels. So if you look at active energy expenditure relative to fat-free mass, you know, hunter-gatherers are way more than twice what chimpanzees spend, and even sedentary human beings spend way more physical en uh, energy on physical activity uh, than wild chimpanzees. So, uh, so if you think you're sedentary, just watch a chimp. And yet, remember energy allocation theory, because of trade-offs, right? You, you know, humans are involved to be more physically active than apes, but still you only want to be as physically active as you need to, right? You only want to do it when it's necessary or rewarding. Otherwise, any um, physical activity that you do that doesn't uh, benefit your, your fitness, your, that is your reproductive fitness, your Darwinian fitness is energy wasted. So, so for example, this morning I went for a long run about, about 10 miles. So I probably spent about a thousand calories if I had been a hunter-gatherer, it was a completely stupid thing to do, right? I mean, I would basically be, be wasting all that energy, which I could, could be using on my family and, and reproduction and things like that. So, um, so, uh, so you know, people have this idea that hunter-gatherers are incredibly physically active, but they're actually only moderately physically active. So we have data from, uh, from, from for example, populations like the Hadza, um, but others as well. And, and if you look at the levels of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So basically a brisk walk or above, um, they spend about two and a quarter hours a day um, at, at, at those levels of physical activity. And they actually sit for about 10 hours a day. Um, so <clears throat> they're actually not that different from Americans or Brits or whatever in terms of how much they sit. But, um, but of course things have changed, right? Um, they didn't change so much with our range of agriculture because agriculture, if you don't have tractors and and other, and other machines is really hard work, right? Uh, these are scenes from the area in Kenya where, where we've been doing field work for the last 15 years, but it's really hard work, even, even a plow, right? You, I've tried actually, actually after these guys, after I took this photo, I actually went and, and tried using that plow with these guys. It's one of the 
most physically demanding things I've ever done in my life. People are carrying water, they're carrying food, they're carrying babies, they're digging. Uh, so, so if you look at physical activity levels of, of subsistence farmers, they're actually a little bit higher on average than hunter-gatherers. It's hard work. But we invented the modern world, right? So we invented machines and we have now a post-industrial lifestyle for most of us where we have paid to sit rather than, than be active. And not surprisingly, physical activity levels have plunged by at least 25%. Again, that's not how much physical activity you're actually doing. That's the physical activity level that's plunged. We've, but we've, we've decreased our physical activity levels by, by many hundreds of calories per day of active energy expenditure. And this has come at an enormous cost to human health. Again, this is from this paper that Dave Reichland and I just recently published in Current Biology. But if you look at step, just simply steps per day, and I plotted here the hazard ratio of all cause mortality and the relative risk of incident cardiovascular disease. And, um, and then I, we plotted uh, gorillas and chimps and sedentary humans and hunter gatherers. And you can see that uh, sedentary humans, of course, are more active than chimps and gorillas, but even then, we're not at the level where this curve begins to flatten off for all-cause mortality, which turns out to be about 7,000 steps a day. Um, and, uh, and we're way below the, the level that causes substantial reductions in cardiovascular disease, which by the way, is the non number one killer of people today in Western, in Western industrialized countries like England and the United States. So, so if, you, if you're a hunter-gatherer um, level sort of physical activity, you decrease your relative risk of incident cardiovascular disease. Um, by by many uh, by many fold. Uh, here's another way of looking at it. This is from an enormous study of data pulled from Europe and the United States. Um, in the in the histograms are the uh, percentage of adults who get different amounts of minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. That's the x-axis, and the blue line here is the relative risk of all-cause mortality. And you can see that most people, are, of course, are physically inactive and they have high levels of all-cause mortality just a little bit of physical activity, like what the World Health Organization recommends, which is 21 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, but results in a, this is an age corrected measure of mortality, results in a 30% reduction. And getting down to, and it flattens out, but getting down to pre-industrial levels leads to about a 40% reduction in all cause mortality at a given age. So because of that, right, because physical activity is important, but we live in a world where physical activity has now become optional, we invented exercise, right? Which I define as discretionary, voluntary, planned physical activity for the sake of health and fitness. It's kind of a weird thing, right? Um, um, imagine telling your hunter-gatherer ancestors to get on a treadmill. They would like look at you and like, what on earth are you asking me to do? And to be honest, I never really thought about this until I was doing field work in, um, actually in, Me in Northern Mexico. We were studying uh, the Tarahumara who are famous for their long distance running. And I was traveling around as being a good anthropologist and I was measuring people's feet and looking at their biomechanics, but I was also asking them questions. And it was actually this guy here. Uh, he's actually a, a, an old, older fellow. And they're, they're, most people there don't run, by the way, but only a few people there are really great runners. And this guy is a, is a famous runner. He's also a shaman. And I remember asking him you know, through a translator, because I don't speak Gwaramuri, the, the local language. And I asked him you know, how often he trains. And he looked at me and I, even <laughs> I could figure out what he was saying. He was like, it was like, why would I run if I didn't have to, right? Um, and, the, and they don't train, right? They, they run, uh, th their lifestyle is their training and they, and they, um, and they, and when they, they only run when they, when they have races, right? Um, and so, um, and I realized, you know, what I do is a really weird thing, right? And by weird, um, using uh, the term that uh, Joe Henrik and company, my colleague Joe Henrik and company uh, advised called uh, which is an acronym for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. But it's, you know, these are, you know, exercise is something that we invented in the modern world. And it's, you know, lifting weights who, with, that you bought for the sole purpose of lifting them is a really weird thing, right? Or getting on a treadmill, this horrible, nasty machine that makes you work really hard and gets you absolutely nowhere and a little bit dangerous, can spit you off and incredibly boring. I mean, just think about just how weird it is. And by the way, if you think a treadmill as a form of torture, you're actually right, it was actually invented the, the kind of treadmill was actually invented in Victorian prisons as a way of, of preventing uh, prisoners from enjoying themselves. So, um, so they, had to, uh, they had to trudge on these giant treadmills to kind of make their lives more miserable, like the debtor's prisons and things like that. Okay. So we exercise now because exercise is healthy and we have had to replace physical activity for exercise. But the problem, the fundamental problem is that we were selected to avoid physical activity that's neither necessary nor rewarding, right? Otherwise, it's just kind of a stupid waste of energy, right? 
And a good way of thinking about that um, is, uh, is if you've ever been in a subway stop or a, or a hospital or a you know or an airport or whatever where um, um, where you've got a, a escalator next to a stairway, and it turns out that wherever you are in the world, whether you're in Japan or the United States or Israel or places they've done this study, uh, only about five percent of people will actually naturally take the stairs. Ninety-five percent of people will line up to take the escalator because it's an instinct, right? It's a basic fundamental instinct to avoid physical activity that's neither necessary nor rewarding. For most people, climbing up the stairs is neither necessary nor rewarding. By the way, just from the, for the shot, I actually photoshopped this woman onto the stairs because I thought it was pathetically, you know, so few people on the stairs. Okay, so there was selection for increased physical activity, uh, but there's also selection for avoiding exercise, but that doesn't really explain why physical activity or exercise um, reduces our vulnerability ability to disease and also slows senescence. To give you some evidence for this, there's lots and lots of studies. One of my favorites, because I'm, I'm a professor at Harvard, um, is, is actually the first big major epidemiological study that was ever conducted on exercise and aging by this guy over here, Ralph Paffenbarger. He was a great innovator in exercise science. He was a professor here at Harvard Medical School. And he realized that places like Harvard, or for that matter, I'm sure Cambridge, are fantastic for these kinds of studies because uh, Cambridge and Harvard never let go of their of their graduates, right? You, when, when you guys graduate from Cambridge, Cambridge, I mean, I get letters from Cambridge all the time asking me for money, um, you know, and you will too, right? They, they will never, wherever corner of the planet you are on, they will continue to keep finding you and, and keep track of you, right? And um, and so Paffenbarger realized this is a fantastic opportunity to study aging and exercise. And so he followed for, for more than 25 years, a group of alumni from several different classes um, got information about their physical activity rates and their and 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 whether they smoked and you know all kinds of other covariate data, um, and um, and and this is a the famous graph that he published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But on the y-axis is the all-cause death rate, uh, um, as uh, summarized to you know per ten thousand years, and on the x-axis is their physical activity level in three bins. So people who got less than 500 calories a week of physical activity, so basically sedentary individuals, and he's normalized them, and the numbers are the normalized to values of one. People who got between 500 and 2,000 calories of exercise a week, so just a little bit, but not a lot. And people who got more than 2,000 calories of exercise, which uh, if you wanna know is like basically going for a run four times a week for like, like you know, a few miles each, right? So it's not a crazy amount of physical activity. And you can see that for the alums, and this is what's nice about the study is that even though it's adjusted for covariates, it's um, it's a you know it's these are you know it's not a very diverse sample so he's been able to correct for socioeconomic class and things like that but you can see that the the alums who are between the ages of 25 and 49 the ones who got 2,000 calories a week had 21 percent lower death rates than the ones who were sedentary in their the ones who were in their 50s the exercisers had 50 excuse me had 36 percent lower death rates than the than the um, than the ones who are sedentary. By the time you get to your 70s, you have 50% lower death rates. And remember, this is not um, this is not just a filter because of you know people people who are um, uh, sick can't exercise. I mean that's been corrected for in the study. So what we're really seeing is that as you get older, physical activity has more and more effect than when you're younger in terms of your health. And this has been shown by many many other studies. So this is just the first big study to show this. So the question is why. And the answer, I believe, is what we call the active grandparent hypothesis, which is there has been selection in human evolution for lifelong physical activity to extend health spans, hence lifespans. And, it, and that explains why physical activity is increasingly healthy as we should age. And this is a paper we published uh, two years ago in PNAS. I should acknowledge my, my co-sponsor, my co-writers, which is Aaron Bagash here, who's now formerly at Harvard, and uh, now at the University of Lausanne, Ayman Lee, who's a professor at the medical school here, and two graduate students here, Tim Kistner and Daniel Richard, are both really great uh, folks. Actually, Daniel Richard just got his PhD, so no other graduate student. Okay, so to explain this, uh, a key concept is the selective shadow, which maybe you, maybe some of you may have encountered in evolutionary biology classes, but, but the idea comes from uh, Sir Peter Medawar, which is that um, as we age, we get older, but senescence is deterioration associated with age. And what Medawar showed was, or, 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 or described, was that once you stop reproducing, uh, natural selection really doesn't care about you, right? Um, there's no, there's, one of the reasons why we senesce and die is that um, we become 
we become irrelevant to selection, right? So we call that the selective shadow. But obviously humans are a little bit different. There's been something about the selective shadow which has changed in humans, right? We have this unique life history. So whereas chimpanzees have a slower life history than, than, than monkeys and can live somewhat longer, and there's a current interesting vigorous debate about just how long chimpanzees can live in the wild. In captivity, they can live longer than in the wild, but, um, but very few chimpanzees make it to their 40s in the wild, right? Um, and very few chimpanzees uh, live to be post-reproductive. But typical hunter-gatherers um, who, whose median age of death is 68 to 78 if they survive childhood, um, about a quarter of hunter-gatherers in any population tend to be post-reproductive. And the average hunter-gatherer female is about 20 years after she stopped reproducing, right? And this is often called the grandmother hypothesis. There's also the embodied capital hypothesis. But the important point is that these grandparents are often doing important things. They're increasing their reproductive success by doing stuff that helps their children and their offspring. And that's shifted the selective shadow in humans compared to apes. I should point out that there's been, of course, an enormous amount of research, including colleagues here, on, on the heritability and the genetics of lifespan. But it turns out that lifespan um, doesn't have a very high heritability. And, and we can talk more about why lifespan is actually a really bad variable in a second. But if you actually look at the data, uh, before the age of 80, there's actually a pretty low heritability, less than 0.2, and that's certainly an overestimate. And there are no, nobody's ever found a gene of large effect. So the major causes of, of premature death are behavioral patterns. So what you eat, physical activity, your social circumstances like stress, pollution, and by the way, access to healthcare explains only about 10% of the variance, right? So, so humans are, um, are, are, are you, know, you can't really look to, to genes as being a major cause of this. And, um, and from an evolutionary perspective, I would argue that we shouldn't even be focusing on lifespan. What we really need to do is focus on health span. So health span is the number of years you live without major disease, right? And until the invention of modern medicine, Lifespan and health span were basically the same thing. So if you look in populations that don't have access to medical care, once people get to end of life morbidity, once their health span is over, they don't, they don't last very long and they have a very quick you know, period towards death. And this is very well studied, right? Um, and we can make some estimates from you know, about the Paleolithic, from industrial, from, from hunter-gatherers. We know data from the, from, the, from the era of agriculture before the Industrial Revolution where, where, whoops, where lifespan and health span were, were definitely shortened. And today in America, for example, the average lifespan of American, actually I need to change the slide. It's just, it's just changed uh, a few days ago. They uh, actually the lifespan of Americans has declined by a year or two because of COVID and, um, and suicide. So it's now 77, but the average health span of our average American is 63. So that means the average American, and that's average, right? So there are plenty of people who are worse than this, spend 16 years prior to, to dying with major uh, morbidity like cardiovascular disease and other sorts of things that you wouldn't have survived uh, prior to modern medicine. So the active grandparent hypothesis uh, is that, you know, that physical activity is actually a major contributor to this extension of, 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 of health span and, this, 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 the, the, and, 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 and affecting that, that period of morbidity. So there are essentially four predictions, right? So the first is that we evolved to be more physically active than apes. The second is that we evolve to remain physically active as we age. The third, there is selection for physical activity to promote health span, health lifespan, and that's probably the most important one. And then finally, this is more kind of one that's a little bit more of a question mark here, which is that physical activity affects health span and lifespan more in humans than other animals. So let's look at these four predictions. So first, the first one I've already kind of told you about, so we don't have to spend any time on it, right? Which is that humans evolved to be more physically active than apes. And I've already showed you the data behind this. It's pretty clear, right? Um, the second one is that we evolved to remain physically active as we age. And, uh, to sh and that's also not really very contentious, right? So this is, for example, a graph of data from the Hadza um, collected by, uh, by Dave Reichlin and, and uh, Brian Wood and Herman Ponzer uh, compared to the average for US males and US females. I don't think England is gonna be much different from the US graph. And you can see that there's a decline in both populations, including among the Hadza, but even even like 70, 80 year old Hadza are still um, 15 times more active than your average equivalent aged Westerner, right? So they're still hunting, they're still gathering every day. There's lots of evidence for this. Another example of this is, um, is data that was collected many years ago by Kristen Hawks on the Hadza. 
and she looked at how many hours a day were spent digging. She compared uh, uh, females before they uh, uh, had offspring, mothers and grandmothers, and you can see that grandmothers are digging four to eight hours a day as opposed to mothers who are digging two to five hours a day. So physical activity levels are, are, are remain high, if not higher, in grandparents than, 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 than parents. And of course, the reason for that is, is, is because of energy, right? So this is a, a super famous graph from a, from a super famous paper by Kaplan et al. in, in 2000. And what this shows is uh, chimpanzees, this is age in the x-axis. These are females and males in the, uh, in the two graphs. This is calories per day on the y-axis. And you can see that chimpanzees, production and consumption is the same. But in humans, uh, production is uh, in the solid line and consumption is in the dashed line. And human females run a deficit up until they become grandparents, right? And it's only when they become grandparents, they start producing um, uh, more than they consume. And of course, they're giving that surplus to their children and their grandchildren. Males are, of course, also producing a surplus. That's through hunting and, and, and honey collecting and other sorts of things. And so they're also uh, uh, contributing uh, food to their children and their grandchildren. All right, so we evolved to be more physically active as we age and stay physically active as we age. So the third prediction is probably the most complicated one, right? But in some ways, the most important one, and that there's been selection for physical activity to promote health span. And again, remember, prior to modern medicine, health span equals lifespan. And to, again, to go back to our fundamentals, that's because of trade-offs, right? When you, um, when you are physically active, right, you're generating, you're using energy, but that also generates stress, right? Um, so, um, and that, that, that energy use is a stress. So there's several, there several trade-offs. So the first trade-off is that physical activity diverts energy from reproduction, right? So, um, so when, you, when you're more physically active, you can spend less energy on reproduction. And there's lots of data on this. Um, a very simple one actually comes from, from the office I'm actually sitting in. My the person who had this office before me was uh, Peter Ellison, a famous uh, reproductive endocrinologist. And he did a study um, uh, here in Cambridge where he looked at, at, at healthy women who are just jogging 20 kilometers a week. So they're spending only 180 kilocalories a day on physical activity. It's not... This is not a lot, right? This is pretty, pretty mild levels of physical activity. And he showed that, and this is a salivary progesterone on the x on the y-axis, days before menstruation on the on the on the x-axis. And you can see that in red, the women who were running, spending just 180 calories a day, nothing serious, have 50% lower levels of progesterone than sedentary women. Now you could say one way of thinking about this is saying, oh, being physically active depresses your um, your um, your your energy allocation to reproduction, but think about it, 180 calories a day is nothing, right? And what it really is, is that is a reverse, which is that when you're physically inactive, your body says, hey, I've got more energy and I can increase the levels I'm going to spend of uh, energy I can spend on reproduction. So actually it's a shift upward in these sedentary women who have now higher levels of progesterone, they have higher levels of estrogen, males who are inactive have higher levels of testosterone, and of course, that has important effects on health, which we'll talk about in a second, for example, for breast cancer. Thus, um, the other trade-off, right, has to do with stress, right? And because when you're physically active, you're stressing your body, right? Um, whoops, sorry. Actually, let me go back to that previous thing about, about reproduction. Sorry, I went in the wrong direction, right? So this is data showing um, hours per week of what's called a met. So a, a, a met is a metabolic equivalent. So a met of one is the energy you spend just sitting, right? And this is the odds ratio of getting breast cancer. This is lifetime risk of breast cancer for estrogen and progesterone sensitive breast cancer. So women who exercise an hour a day, right? This is a, this is a, a, a meta analysis, not just one study, have an overall lifetime reduction of about 55% in their lifetime risk of breast cancer, right? And that's because Estrogen and progesterone are mitotic hormones that increase, that increase the risk of cancer. And in fact, if you look at all cancers, it doesn't matter which kind of cancer you're looking at, every kind of cancer, people who exercise an hour a day have on average about a 30% reduction of, 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 um, of, of cancer than people who don't exercise, right? And this, and this is just an hour of walking a day. This is not like running, right? So physical activity by diverting energy from reproduction actually um, has uh, a benefit because in our sedentary world, what we're doing is we're ex ac allocating excess energy to reproduction. 
Okay. The other, a second trade-off is between physical activity and fat storage. And I don't think this is too controversial. Uh, this is a one, you know, if you spend less energy in physical activity and you're still taking in the same amount of energy, you can store that as fat, right? And here's a, a very famous experiment that was done by a collaborator of mine, Benta Clarland Olsen in, in, um, in Denmark, but she got uh, 14 Danish guys to basically just sit for two weeks, uh, but not change their diet. And just in two weeks, they added a lot of fat, especially they added visceral fat. That's fat in the abdomen. That's highly inflammatory fat. This is the fat that causes a wide range of, of metabolic diseases. So this is an MRI scan of the same guy before and after. So he added quite a lot of visceral fat just by sitting for two weeks. And when you have a combination of fat plus physical inactivity, you get what's called, you get basically a double whammy. So when fat cells swell, they become dysfunctional and they uh, attract white blood cells that simulate inflammation. And inflammation is the major cause of most of the diseases that we, we're scared about from Alzheimer's to diabetes and atherosclerosis and heart disease, et cetera. Uh, but importantly, it turns out that when you're physically inactive, in addition to storing more fat, which causes inflammation, it turns out that physical activity and the and use of muscles is the major way in which we suppress, the body suppresses inflammation. Again, this is research that we're doing in conjunction with Benta Peterson in, in Copenhagen. Um, and we just published this paper in Nature Metabolism and this with Tim Kistner, my grad student. And so what's going on here is that when you're physically active, right, you increase all kinds of stresses. You increase lactic acid production. You, you have less glycogen in your muscles. That's glycogen is the mammalian form of carbohydrate. You increase reactive oxygen species, which all kinds of damage. And that causes your muscles to secrete interleukin-6, which is this, this, uh, this cytokine, which regulates the immune system. And IL-6 actually evolved as an energetic regulator, right? It includes, increases gluconeogenesis, so the production of glucose by the liver. It increases breakdown of fat uh, in muscles, in fat cells and in muscles. And that makes, whoops, um, and that makes you know, sugar and fats available, which, which your muscles can then use. But then it turns out that the immune system co-opted this, 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 uh, this signal, this, sig this regulator, this cytokine, and it turns out it's the major energetic re regulator of inflammation. And so at low levels of IL-6, it's actually inflammatory, but high levels of IL-6 actually cause, um, uh, turns on uh, other uh, molecules which actually turn off inflammation. So people who are physically inactive have much higher levels of inflammation than people who are active. In physical activity, the, the, your muscles actually produce the vast majority of this IL-6 at high levels, which actually decreases inflammation. Stay tuned. We have more. We have more, 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 more to come on that. We have a lot of studies coming up from my lab on that. So the bottom. So the third foot. The trade-off is kind of related to that, which is that physical activity diverts energy towards repair and maintenance, as I just told you, right? So when you're physically active, you cause various kinds of stresses, reactive oxygen species, and damage in every tissue in your body. But every single tissue in your body turns on various kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms that are activated by physical activity prevent physical activity from being deleterious, right? So when you're physically active and you produce reactive oxygen species, your muscles also produce antioxidants that wipe up those reactive oxygen species. Your muscles produce anti-inflammatories, as I just showed you. Your muscles turn on other enzymes that repair cells and DNA and, and turns on growth factors for pretty much every tissue of your body from your muscle to your brain, to your bone, to your liver, et cetera, right? Um, that's why physical activity is healthy. And um, we can actually measure the energetic cost. And this is again, something that we're spending a lot of time and energy in my lab doing. And this is some, it's colloquially called afterburn, but we call it excess post-exercise oxygen consumption because we're not allowed to use simple terms, right? Or EPOC. So if you go for, you know, if you're sitting around and then you go for a run, right? You're gonna use all this energy. Then afterwards, your metabolism is gonna be elevated for a certain amount of time. It depends on how much and how, how long will depend on the kind of activity that you engaged in, right? And we can measure that um, with oxygen. It's not too hard to do. And it turns out that if you have a, somebody do a, basically a sort of standard Hadza life, you know, physical activity level, right? Where you're, where you're walking 150 minutes a day and maybe do 20 minutes a day of sort of more vigorous physical activity, that turns on an epoch response of about 50 to 100 calories a day. And that's way more than the epoch response of just moderate physical activity. So somebody who does just 41 minutes a day or, or somebody who's basically inactive or follows just the US, you know, World Health Organization recommendations of 20 minutes, whoops, 20 minutes a day, 
right? And by the way, EPOC, only about the maximum EPOC that's spent on energy replacement is about 20%. So 80% is going into repair and maintenance. So you can calculate over many, many years. So for example, if you spend 20 years exercising like a Hadza compared to a, 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 an inactive American, you're gonna spend, you're gonna generate, you're gonna spend 282,800 more calories over that time period on repair and maintenance. And then I factored out the energy you spent on just replacing the energy that you've used. Okay? That's an enormous amount of energy. That's enough to run hundreds and hundreds of marathons, right? Um, and so it's not, it's not chump change. It's a really substantial amount of energy. Okay, so that's the third prediction. And the fourth and final prediction is that physical activity expect, affects health span more in humans than other animals. And this, I have to admit, is the most conjectural part. And I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna bet the farm on this one. But if you look at other animals, like for example, rodents, when you exercise them, they don't live longer if you exercise them. So for example, rats, if you exercise them, uh, they, they don't actually have a, a more survival or, or longer lifespan than rats who are sedentary. Same is true of mice. Um, um, and in fact, if you look at, uh, this is a, a, a paper that was published in Nature just a few years ago, where they looked at uh, mortality rates and also rates of senescence in wild versus captive animals. And they were thinking, well, you know, if you, if you correct for predation, you'd think that wild animals would do better than animals in zoos because they're more active and they're more healthy, et cetera. But actually it's quite the reverse, right? Animals in zoos have slower rates of senescence. They have longer maximum lifespans. Um, so, so it looks like physical activity in these animals is not um, having a major effect. Of course, there's issues of, 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 of animal care and veterinary care, et cetera. So I wouldn't you know, bet the farm on this one. All right, just to sum up, for the active grant hypothesis predictions, right? Humans evolved to be more physically active than apes. I think we can agree on that. We evolved to remain physically active as we age. I don't think that's controversial. I think we can agree that there's been selection for physical activity to promote health span and therefore lifespan in the age before medical care. I think we can hopefully agree on that. And then finally, again, a bit more conjectural, but I think there's some evidence, and of course this needs to be studied more, that physical activity affects health span and lifespan more in humans than in other animals. So to conclude, we were selected for lifelong physical activity. We're also selected to avoid unnecessary, unrewarding physical activity, AKA exercise. The stress and energy costs of physical act activity cause trade-offs that allocate energy away from investments that compromise health and towards repair and maintenance. And overall, I would argue that our evolutionary history explains why lifelong physical activity is so important for slowing senescence and decreasing our vulnerability to many diseases. It's not a magic bullet, um, but it sure is uh, uh, important. And as, as the world becomes more sedentary, especially as people move from rural areas to urban areas around the world, um, we really need to pay more attention to helping people uh, be more physically active. Um, and I think evolutionary biology and um, human evolutionary research um, has an important role to play in that. And then finally, one last thought to kind of um, leave you with, which is that if we evolve to be physically activity when it's only when it's necessary and rewarding, we have to find ways to make exercise both necessary and rewarding. And I have, by the way, very fond memories of hunting on the cam back in the day. I hope all of you get a chance to do that. Maybe it's a good Valentine's Day thing to do. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And there's lots of folks that have helped out with this. Um, and if you're more interested, I've got a, a book we recently just published on this called Exercised and also I encourage you to check out the actor grant parent hypothesis in PNAS. So with that, I'll stop talking. All right, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, yeah, so now we'll take questions. Uh, you can either feel free to use the raise hand function and unmute yourself and ask a question, um, or if your microphone's not working or you're not comfortable asking out loud, you can just send it in the chat. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Professor Stringer would like to ask out loud or if I should read it. Uh, I guess I guess I'll I'll read it. Uh, so he says, is oh, yeah, okay. Uh, is selection acting differently for uh, grandfathers versus grandmothers? Uh, Chris, nice to nice to see you here. Um, um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think uh, selection is um, uh, probably is different for males and females because of their different life history and reproductive uh, strategies. Um, but there's no question that um, um, 
uh, physical activity is both helpful for males and females, and, and that the mechanisms that they act on, right, are probably the same, right? So, you know, when males and females exercise, they both produce antioxidants, they both produce IL-6 that cuts down on inflammation, they both produce, you know, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which, you know, decreases, um, you know, which, 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 which restores um, um, uh, synapses in the brain and, and promotes uh, uh, neuronal growth. So, so I'm sure that there are differences in the way energy is allocated in males and females. We know that for sure, but the repair and maintenance and certainly uh, selection may be acting differently on, 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 on the kind of, on that aspect and sort of fat storage, but, but the repair and maintenance mechanisms I would suspect are probably pretty similar for males and females. That said, males and females will tell you different prices for, for how they, um, you know, they reproduce over age. So, so I'm sure that there are probably some subtle differences, but uh, I think, uh, I don't think it changes the basic argument, but great question. Yeah, and I also have a, a question. Well, I guess people gather their thoughts for more. Uh, so I guess you said with the like the couch potato hypothesis that the animals are like conserving their energy, not doing excess energy like when they don't have to, so that they can reallocate that for more fitness enhancing activities. And I know you said for the the zoo animals like tended to live longer when they're being less active um but that might be due to like veterinary care like lack of predation there's no poaching um but well, they, that, that, that study corrected for predation so that correct oh okay okay so that was so um, they only looked at maximum lifespan rather than, than than when animals died because of you know being eaten by each other oh okay um yeah so i guess that kind of helps answer but i noticed with the rodents it looked like they all lived about the same whether they're yeah. exercising or not yeah. so yeah. do you know why the rodents which exercise more like wouldn't die sooner because they're just using their energy for non-fitness enhancing activities well uh, that's a good question so we, you know we um first of all rodents have very different life histories than humans right i mean they're they're very r selected they, they're basically evolved to pump out as many babies as possible because life, you know, you never know when, when, um, when, you know, when a cat's gonna kill you, right? So uh, they're, they're, they're not selected for that kind of long post-reproductive lifespan. And so since you wouldn't expect there to be as much selection for the repair and maintenance mechanisms that result from physical activity to have any effect on, 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 on health span longevity. In other words, repair and maintenance is not the function, not, not, the, not the goal of a, of a rodent, right? It's just pumping out as many babies as quickly as possible. So the, the, again, this is the most speculative part of the hypothesis, but, but, the, but the important point is that because humans have a different life history than other animals because of this post-reproductive period, and because during that post-reproductive period, we didn't evolve to go to Florida, right? And just kick up our heels and just do nothing, right? We evolved, you know, hunter-gatherer grandparents aren't just sitting around in camp waiting for people to come back and feed them, right? They're off every day hunting and gathering and, you know, taking care of grandchildren and doing all kinds of stuff. And so they're living long in order to be physically active. And that physical activity is helping them live longer in a, in a healthy state, right? And so because of that, the prediction is that there should be so more selection for that. I'm not saying there's no selection for that in other animals, but that plays a greater role in humans. And so you can make the case that there's, that's why we call it the active grandparent hypothesis, that, that, that the role of physical activity in, as we get older, is important for maintaining health span, which in turn allows hunter-gatherers to be active to improve their reproductive su success. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and are there any other questions? Uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask one. Um, so th there's obviously no question that um, an increase in exercise is very much beneficial for decreasing cardiovascular disease and, you know, inflammation. But do, do, do a lot of these studies account for um, perhaps the fact that they've got a Hadza and hunter gatherers generally have a better diet and lifestyle. They've got um, a more diverse gut microbiome and, you know, their general, you know, natural env environment that they're living in day to day is a lot more um, attuned to nature and, you know, 
um, their uh, metabolism and also they're in their resting state you know even the hads are are more active you know they're squatting rather than just sitting no actually they first of all squatting doesn't take much energy let me tell you but um um the um the, the data we have on the and the health benefits of physical activity do not come from the Hadza. I'm only using Hadza for, 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 for data on, on you know, what the average you know, physical activity level of was in humans. The data that we have on the health benefits of physical activity come from studies of literally millions and millions of people around the world in every country on the planet, right? Um, so that, those data don't come from Hadza, so, so, um, uh, or, or from any other hunter-gatherer population. What we do know is, of course, is, is that many of those hunter-gatherer populations suffer less from the kinds of mismatch diseases that we have today, right? That's what my previous book, The Story of the Human Body, was about, right? So cardiovascular disease is less common in those populations. Um, um, cancers are probably less common in those populations, but they're harder to diagnose. Alzheimer's probably less in those populations. And part of that comes from their diet, of course, but part of that also comes from physical activity because they're very physically active. So the test of that hypothesis would be to look at physically inactive Hadza, right? And see what happens to them, right? Now we can't do that naturally for the Hadza. That's a, you can't do an experiment like that. That's unethical. But we have, that, we have those data from plenty of other populations. So the population in Kenya where I work, right? Where we look at, at people who, who move from, from rural to urban areas and become less physically active and don't change their diet, for example, we can actually look at that. They, they're, they're, you know, they're much more likely to get diabetes and you know, all kinds of other diseases. So that's been well studied in, um, in population after population, including non-Western populations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it looks like there's a, a question in the chat. Uh, so Eva says, um, Similar to Chris, Chris's question, do you have uh, ideas on uh, how menopause relates to physical activity in older women? Uh, since they progressively have lower levels of sex hormones, uh, this could mean the trade-off is different than in older males. So menopause is not, um, menopause is, 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 is caused by atresia. Um, and the, the, the rate at which uh, eggs, um, you lose eggs, and that's not affected by um, estrogen or progesterone. Uh, actually, the eggs themselves are producing the progesterone and the estrogen. So, um, uh, so, uh, so physically active women are not more, you know, do not hit menopause at different times than, than, than less physically active women. So that's not, that's not the, the effect that's going on. Certainly, uh, physical activity does affect hormone levels in women uh, profoundly, and that has uh, effects on Many aspects of their biology um, that, of course, are relevant to health, but uh, but it's not affecting the age at which they go through menopause. Um, and then, I guess the the second half of her question, um, I guess, is asking whether. Um, well, I mean, sure, re 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 reproductive between I mean, energy. I mean, females use energy differently for reproduction than males. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was sort of pointing that out. So no, I'm not saying that they're the same in males and females, of course not. Uh, so remember, there are different kinds of trade-offs that are physical activity costs. One is the trade-off that's in sort of energy allocation towards reproduction. That's of course can be stronger in females than in males. But the other trade-off is between energy allocation towards repair and maintenance. And I don't believe that that's gonna be different between females and males. I have no evidence. I've never seen any evidence that it's at all different. All right. Yeah, thank you for that. And then I guess uh, we have one, I think one more question, and I guess we can make this the the final question. Um, and so someone al also says, um, how can you test the hypotheses in early humans? Uh, well, you can't. I mean, you can't do physiology in early humans, right? Well, we can, <laughs> I mean, we have to study the biology of modern creatures, but, you know, we can study how exercise functions in humans. We can study how it functions in, in other species. Many of the biological mechanisms are the same. Um, um, you know, um, you know, we're, we're, we didn't, we haven't invented this complete new biology. Um, um, we can also study, we can get estimates of physical activity, but not very good ones from the fossil record. When we can look at when hunting started and when, you know, um, oh, uh, come on in. Excuse me, I have, I have office hours, so some students are going to be trumping it, but I'll finish. Uh, uh, sure. I, if you could just open the door and then, uh, um, so, um, um, uh, you know, so we, you know, we can't, uh, we can't 
be precise about it, but uh, you know, hunting and gathering, there's no way to be a hunter-gatherer without spending a fair amount of physical activity. You have to travel around and find resources and you have to hunt, you have to scavenge. Um, so, you know, modern hunter, in, and there's no way that uh, modern hunter-gatherers um, are, um, are working, um, you know, uh, you know, if I, were, if I were Homo erectus without as much technology as a Hadza, I have the same body size, but I don't have as much technology. So if anything, I'd probably have to work harder to get the same number of calories. So I, I don't, I think they're reasonable minimum estimates of physical activity. And you also just look at the biology. I mean, they have, they're clearly, they're adapted for running. They have all kinds of physical, uh, uh, you know, big gluteus maximuses and short toes and arches in their feet and semicircular canals. So we can see that they have all this anatomy that makes no sense except for you know physical activity for long distance walking for running for carrying all those sorts of things all right well thank you very much for the talk um it's been very interesting spurred a lot of questions uh and yeah and thank you for agreeing to to come and my give pleasure it. Have and a happy Hel valentine's day yeah happy valentine's day and then just wanted to give a short announcement that uh Actually, in two weeks, our next talk will be with Professor Cheryl LaRoche on the power and lessons of Black history. So please join us. Um, yeah, so thank you right. and have a nice Valentine's Day. All See right, you. take care. All right, bye-bye. Thank you very much.